GDP. We should be measured on how well our society is. There is still no action here on our incredibly high and growing suicide rates and our rates of mental health. So I'm, I'm very much behind raising awareness for that. And as much as I can, I talk to it. Um, I do a lot of, of speaking groups and uh, bringing people together to try and, and combat this. In Singapore, the same. Uh, Singapore is an incredible case, uh, as you mentioned earlier, one that where it's swept under the carpet. Singaporean society and a lot of Asian society, I'm sure you know in Vietnam, just do not talk about so they just do not talk about it's a failure if someone kills themselves it's um a failure the word commits hey everybody mark Ahrensberg here with the pure now show this is episode number 14. My guest today is Mark Pickering. Mark is a 30 year veteran in marketing and advertising, specializing in event marketing. He's also an advocate of mental health. Great to have him on the show. Here we go. Film all these great events and we would want to create film great experiences and people having a good time. So uh, that's kind of in a, in, a, in, a, in a short nutshell how the creativity worked. And then of course, I went to Singapore and began creative directing. I think I think that's more than anything. I'm more of a connector of, of good good creative minds. Yeah, that's key. I mean, you're a, you're a facilitator, a conduit, and uh, you can uh, get the people together, which is very, you know, event and immersion focused. And that seems to be where things are going. And once the smoke does clear on the pandemic and, and things begin to normalize, do you feel that these immersive experiences are gonna be more prevalent and that this is gonna be a, a way for brands to reach a much larger audience and get a better foothold on their target market? I think it will happen eventually, Mark. I think, you know, and New Zealand's been the, the uh, I, I was gonna use bubble, but I'm not gonna use that word because it sounds bad, but, you know, we've been the Ted the Petri dish here because we've been able to have events with 60,000 people attending. What we've seen is uh, that yes, people are hungry for experiences. People have gone back in droves to music festivals. People have gone back. This is New Zealand, I have to say. This is a different to the rest of the world. We have been COVID free. We have, we're not England, we're not the States, we're not Singapore, where there are a hundred cases a day still happening and people are learning to live with it. Up until this week, we had zero cases. So we're living in a, in a different world. And, and in, a, in a world where there are zero COVID cases, people have embraced the live experience, music, art, fashion, sport, food, immersing their senses again, but they've wanted to be with people. And again, I'll caveat, in a zero COVID environment, people have loved it. And some brands have gone, yeah, we want to get onto this brand experience thing. We want to we do that. And they've gone into festivals. But a lot of the brands, because of COVID, are still risk averse. So I don't see, and, and, that, and I would imagine budgetary wise, the budgets have been halved because the budgets are on with TV, because even with or without COVID, people are still watching their screen. Right. And that's on demand. So, so marketing spend has gone to digital on and on demand, and and even to traditional linear TV. So, yeah, it'll happen. Uh, but you know, I, I'm, I've got a lot of friends in the music industry in in the UK at the moment. You know, that's festival land, and in the US. And look, you know, they're putting on these big festivals, but not as many people are going. People are still aware that there are people with COVID, and people have fake. COVID passports and, you know, there are people who are still, you know, and quite rightly averse to going out. People with asthma, people with underlying health conditions will not be going out to a crammed nightclub to listen to their favorite band and, and drink Smirnoff vodka and enjoy a brand experience. So that will take a couple of years to pass, I think, in countries where they haven't eliminated the virus. Um, you know, that's that's the, the challenge that we're, we're faced with. I think there will now always be a, 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 a fear around that. Um, it, it, and until it changes our consciousness or, um, or, or our health system and the vaccines manage to create whatever the herd immunity thing is, I think people will still be a little bit scared to, to get involved, but it, it, it will happen. 
Yeah, well, we're definitely seeing a change in human behavior patterns and uh, and risk assessment uh, uh, versus the dangers Correct. of yeah. just yeah. literally going outside. And I think it's a fascinating in the sense that wear your seat belt, drive slowly, uh, look after your family. You, know, you 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 can't go an hour on New Zealand television without seeing an advertisement for for, for motor vehicle accidents. But we don't see any ads for suicide prevention. We, we barely see ads. The government here, again, even though we have a, 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 um, a great leader in Jacinda who, who believes in uh, we should be measured on wellness in our society. We shouldn't be measured on uh, GDP. We should be measured on how well our society is. There is still no action here on our incredibly high and growing suicide rates. And our rates of mental health. So I'm, I'm very much behind raising awareness for that. And as much as I can, I talk to it. Um, I do a lot of speaking groups and uh, bringing people together to try and, and combat this. In Singapore, the same. Uh, Singapore is an incredible case, uh, as you mentioned earlier, one that, where it's swept under the carpet. Singaporean society and a lot of Asian society, I'm sure you know in Vietnam, just do not talk about, so they just do not talk about, it's a failure. If someone kills themselves, it's um, a failure. The word commit suicide comes from the terminology that if you tried to kill yourself, you would be committed. That's why you just say to suicide. So in Singapore, up until a few years ago, if you tried to jump off a building and you failed, you would go to jail. That's how that, that society deals with suicide, which is, um, you know, it's 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 not great. It's, it's Singapore, most of the people who try to end their life in Singapore are elderly because they feel that they're a burden on their children. Who's the fan you, who's the player you want, why? Uh, again, there was a website where you could vote for the player that you were gonna buy. The, the way they'd integrated this incredible campaign, again, insight-based, looking for the human stories around fandom, uh, the fan advocacy, the, you know, there wasn't user-generated content per se, but there were a lot of great activities that the fans got into. They would do, uh, I guess, in the, America, in the American vernacular um, stuff to get everyone Tailgate down. party. Yeah, that's right, and sell cans of Coke. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just, and, and of course, Coke sales went through the roof. I mean, you can imagine what a difference it made to the, to the sales, but more than that, what it did, it made the communities really embrace Coca-Cola as someone who was supporting them at the grassroots level. And it changed people's perception of Coke as this big red brand. It wasn't big and red and a big American brand anymore. This is in England, of course. It was a brand that was local. It was a brand that supported Norwich City Football Club, you know, this little town football club. So. I think being part of that and seeing the joy uh, that it brought to people's faces was the uh, most important thing. And again, I'm very much about this human interaction, the storytelling, but the change it made to those small clubs, the people, the fans uh, was, was moving. It was really, really amazing. It was great. Okay, now give me the opposite. You don't have to be specific with the name <laughs> of the client. Uh, but give me an idea of, of maybe a project that was not going as well as you'd hoped. But in the end, of course, you know, through pain is growth. And we do learn things regardless of uh, how they feel at the time. But there must have been some projects uh, that were far more challenging for you that uh, uh, in the end maybe worked out okay. But along the way, we're a little uncomfortable. There will always be clients who don't trust, I think, you know, and whether that, and again, that's like any relationship. That's, um, <laughs> that's marriage, that's friendship, uh, that's family. You know, if, if you've been hurt in a, in a past iteration or you've had a bad experience, that will reflect into your new one, right? That'll, that'll, that'll impact the way you, so if you've had a bad agency experience, that will mean that you might become somewhat anally retentive uh, around certain things, or you might want to be more hands-on than you potentially should. Like anything in life, uh, just, you know, and again, in my, in my older years, you just sort of go that trust is so important to what you're doing. And I, I, there's no particular brand, but it's those relationships where the client has not trusted what you're doing and has had behaviors that might be perceived as bullying, wanting to be more, ha you know, just wanting to be in every meeting. Yep, yeah, I, I definitely had an, that's just sparked a whole, 
<laughs> range of different ones, but yeah, there was there's a particular commercial, uh, uh, well, series of video content pieces that I made. Yeah, I won't go. I can't go into too much detail. But seriously, the client was everywhere, and 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 you know, we we had a very, uh, you know, one of the best directors in the, in this country shoot the video content. Uh, we had the best crew. Uh, we we did it, you know. Again, as always, you do it for, for because they wanted more crew, so you'd put on more crew. <laughs> um, we had a great vision, the way it should have been shot, uh, the way it should have sounded. Uh, but the client, again, I, I don't know whether it's bad experience or whether it's bad management on their part that they might have bosses pressuring them. I felt I felt I felt that it was more that. The team would have trusted us, but they had a boss going, I need you to know every single detail and be in every single. So even down to the grading, you know, they were in the grading suites, you know, uh, every sound that we were doing, um, it was challenging. There's two things, and I'm client side now. Again, I've been client side before, but I, and I'm now in an organization with 1600 people. So I understand sign off by committee and my God, it's horrendous. Um, I hate to think of the, you know, I've got, I've been working with agencies now and they, they know me well enough because I used to work in an agency. So they know me and they trust me, but, you know, they, I can't get things signed. They want things signed off in two weeks. I've got to give them two months because I've got so many people to get signed off. And I'm also a government organization. So there's bureaucracy as well as 1600 people. But that was the other point. I think we not only was it the micromanagement, but there'd be six clients in the room in that grading suite. So imagine six clients with six opinions under pressure to micromanage. <laughs> That's what made it so difficult and impossible and time consuming and therefore blew out the budget and therefore meant that we lost money as a company and therefore we didn't want to work with that client really uh, in that way again. Even though they were a marquee client, they were like the biggest client in that country, if not the region. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was kind of a situation like we wouldn't work with you again. Client management is probably one of the most challenging parts of being a creative professional is uh, the process. It's not the work itself. It's just uh, getting from A to Z. Yeah. And trust, you know, you, you I, I guess, you know, I've been a suit, so I'm a bit of a hybrid. Uh, my, my, my agency life, I started out as a suit, not a creative. I didn't have enough belief in myself as a creative until the creative uh, director of a big agency here in New Zealand just went, you're not in the wrong department but you kind of are sitting in between here and you need to kind of work out a role, which is when I decided to, to create my own role, which was creative strategist, because that kind of is a suit <laughs> and a creative. Uh, and everyone laughed at me and said, well, that's a silly title. This was, this was about 12 years ago. Everyone's like, well, that's a stupid title. What the heck? And now everyone wants to be a creative strategist. So I don't know, it's funny. But no, I think um, as a suit, the, the biggest skill that you can have is to build trust. To have someone look at you and go, I'll leave that to Mark. He knows what he's doing. He puts me at ease. You know, it's about making it feel valued, feel heard, feel respected. And, and you know, just being there. They're, they're those key things that, that in, in, in any relationship uh, are important. And I think in the creative, you know, if you want people to be creative and get good work, they're the key, key elements as well. Well, I think that's a good transition into you being a mental health advocate. And, yeah. and honestly, uh, it's, it's yeah. foundational. It's the bedrock of humanity. And we are, as homo sapiens, at a critical point right now with mental health. Uh, many parts of the world don't even identify it yeah. as an issue. They're... <laughs>